Christ died to take the sins of the world, not just your sin, the sins of the world on himself. And he was bruised for our iniquities. And you read all those things. And then you read, uh, fear not, little flock. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. These assurances come to us in the form of grace that will give us a measure of peace that is, um, can have the appearance of being the whole thing. But it's not the whole thing. That may surprise you, you for me to hear me say that, but it's not because that peace, the forgiveness that comes through the sacrifice of Christ, is, is the very thing that Christianity at large has used to shift the kingdom away from God's plan for the future and put it on the here and now. I need forgiveness now. If I can find forgiveness now, a sense of forgiveness uh, for whatever it is in my life that went wrong, the peace I get from that is going to be overwhelming to me, but it is not the peace that Christ offers. It's part of that peace. It's essential to that peace. I, I would go so far as to say that the sacrifice of Christ, even though it's identified by Paul as being described um, as the gospel, where he says the good news concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. It's interesting, he didn't say the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, he said his name. And his name doesn't really kind of get too close to the sacrifice and involves it in the word Savior, but um, when Paul was identifying Jesus as being part of the gospel, he wasn't identifying Jesus and the forgiveness that comes from the sacrifice as the gospel. Because he says elsewhere, the gospel is, in thee and thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So that we know that's made possible by the sacrifice of Christ. There is no gospel without Christ. And Christ brings the gospel into full existence and full color, really, by being sacrificed and then promising he's going to come back again and make that gospel a reality for all the nations and peoples of the world in, in which time they will all be blessed. So the gospel isn't forgiveness. The gospel is the result of forgiveness in a people who have manifested God's name and fulfilled the glory of God so that it covers the earth as the waters cover the sea. It's a very subtle distinction, but the distinction is stark when you look at the difference between what Christianity believes the gospel is and what we believe the gospel is. They are, they are stark, even though they are, they're kind of interwoven. So the, there's peace and forgiveness, yes, but the peace of Christ was the glory that was set before him, which enabled him to endure the suffering that he suffered from at the hand of wicked serpent-like mentalities that were that was the mentality of the Pharisees and people who were godless in Israel, to say nothing of the godlessness of the whole world, the Roman Empire world. And so when we look at this, it's not just a Sunday school story. It's a, a, a knowledge that is offered to us as as in, in, in under the umbrella of the knowledge of God that proves to us that God can keep his word and also involves us in a very interesting way. So that's, that's where we're going to go today as we look at the, um, the introduction. What is an introduction? We may not get past the introduction today to Michael standing up. Michael only stands up because of, of what God has done with the nations from the time with the world from the time of the beginning to the time of the end. So, Nebuchadnezzar's image, as you know, is a story of the fall of man at the time that Christ comes back. Dr. Thomas referred to that as the crisis. The crisis is when the stone hits the image on his feet and the historicity of mankind's rule over himself, the kingdom of men, collapses at the collision of the stone with the feet, only to be replaced by a kingdom of God which will never come to an end, as it says in Daniel 2.44. So, um, if, you, if you look at the image as a Sunday school lesson that, that has this amazing series of rise and fall of empires, that's one thing. But if you look at it as something which proves that the kingdom that you hope for in our immediate future is a fact, although it hasn't happened yet, that's a different kind of processing of information. That fact will come, become an anchor that is so... Uh, significant to the stress of every day of your life 
um, that it will, will, will take you through any kind of darkness or problem or uh, stumbling block in this world and bring you into the kingdom. Here's the way Hosea put that at the end of his message. He said, uh, the way of the Lord is right. The righteous, the ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but the wicked stumble in them. It's the same ways of the Lord. Some people are, can walk in them, some people stumble in them. So if, if we go through our average day and all the things that have to happen in my day and your day that give us our standard daily vexation, um, it's very easy for that to loom as a priority in our disposition and kind of become a, a stumbling block to peace. And we can go off, fly off the handle and really our, our human nature can rise up in us and make turn doubt into such darkness that we don't want to live anymore. Uh, we get so angry that we feel murderous in our hearts and, and we, well, those of us who know the truth feel very bad when we feel this way. We worry so badly that we make ourselves sick. We give ourselves diseases and ulcers and things from our worry. Uh, we can have chronic headaches from worries. We can uh, cry ourselves to sleep from our worries. If we can't get to sleep, we can stay awake till 4 o'clock in the morning from the stresses and troubles that, that came and, and knocked us over that day. It can take us months to pull out of that kind of darkness. And when that happens, these temporal problems that we're suffering from tend to become a looming priority in our mental makeup. Whereas Christ says, my peace I give to you. And there was only one thing that kept his temporal problems. People trying to destroy him and he knew it. He could read the hearts of men who hate him. I'm glad I can't do that. Um, I think, I remember reading this week that somebody said, if we knew what people actually say behind us, uh, behind our backs, we would not have four friends in the world. You know, because that, that's sort of the way we are with our human nature. It's not a good thing. So what is it then? Again, the question, the main question of, of the point of this theology is what is it that keeps us on an even keel that enables us to return to the peace that Christ offers us, the same peace that had kept him through his ministry, that will overcome virtually any darkness that overtakes our mind in this life? What is it? Well, part of it is forgiveness, as the baptism of John. Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and everybody was very happy. The baptism of Christ elevated that concept to the death, burial, and resurrection into new life, following the pattern of what Christ did with, with his life. And that's different because it's not just forgiveness, it's new life aiming at a new Jerusalem and a new world in the time when Christ rules it. So, there's two themes that involve Michael standing up. And we're going to look at this closely today because we've got time this summer to actually dwell on it. Usually this is a bulleted list that I, that I just go down very quickly. And we look at it, we say, okay, yeah, that's it. And we go on to the next point because it's in the middle of a presentation. Today, we're going to stay here. We're going to look at the verses that... Um, that work with this theme, that portray it in the Bible, and see how God has given us every kind, he's given us a whole system of anchors to our mental makeup that enable us to keep our priority where he kept his, and that is on the things that lie before us in the future that enable us to endure the sufferings of the present. So, this is a short list of those, those scriptural ideas which may look like Sunday school lessons, they may look like a question in a baptism interview, they may look like um, in the abstract an interesting thing to know prophetically, they may look like a, a parable or a metaphor uh, or a story of some sort that you remember. But they are actually anchors to faith. My belief is this is the only thing that's going to keep our faith anchored through the darkest hour of this world's history. Um, if we don't have these anchors, where's the substance of the things that we hope for? Faith is the substance of the things we hope for. In the end, we'll be saved by faith, by our faith, which is counted to us as righteousness. So we have to have anchors that make faith so substantive 
to, that it is a certainty in our minds. That certainty has the, has the ability to overcome any dark trial, any horrible temptation, any persecution that may come to us, and the cares and pleasures that might otherwise totally distract us because of how appealing they are to us personally in our lives. So let's go down the list here. We have, in the, under the, the umbrella heading of the image of God, we have the seed of the woman. Uh, you know how much the Bible talks about seeds. In the beginning, everything had a seed contained within itself. Uh, that would be the basis of procreation. All the, the, the vegetables and fruits of the world, all the animals of the world, all the trees. And then finally, the people contained the seed for like kind within themselves. Uh, so there's a lot in the Bible about seeds, and it begins with the seed of the woman. Let us make man in our own image. And that promise of making man in our own image came through the seed of the woman. We also have the image of God, because when God said, let us make man in our own image, um, there are lot, several ways you can take that. The way the, the Christian world takes that is it believes that when God made man on a natural level, uh, in the simplest sense, he made the, the anatomy of man after the, the anatomy of God, after his image. So God has eyes, he's got a nose. I remember Morris Wubbles one time gave a talk at the Rockford Bible School in which he started his whole series by saying, does anyone know what God's nose looks like? And then he continued, does, does, does God have a nose? And uh, his point was, do you see God as some a being, a father-like image that you can relate to, who if he has a nose, has a face, and if he has a face, you might stare into his eyes one day. I mean, that, that's the way that idea develops. But um, that's the simplest way you can look at it. Then the other way is that if we were made in the image of God, we're inherently good, and there is a righteousness of man that has been given to us as a part of our uh, inner being that is, um, is good, inherently good. So this image of God idea is subject to some misinterpretation, because that's not true. Human nature is not in the image of God. And you'd, have to, you'd be hard-pressed to argue that people, as they are naturally formed from the dust of, of the ground, are also in the image of God. That doesn't negate any idea that there is some relationship between the way we look and the way God looks because he has councils in heaven where he sits on a throne, he talks to angels, they have discussions, he makes a decision, he sends angels which is our, are his ministering spirits to us and they look like men. So if they're in, a, in a, a, a session in heaven together, either they change and they look like something else there and then they look like men only when they appear to men, or they in fact look like men. To me, um, I think there's, there's some good reason to think that we kind of somehow physically relate to God. Um, or that he's not a square block or an amorphic mass or a being that's as big as a planet. And so, and, and one reason I say that is that Jesus is seated at the right hand of his Father. Right? And, and so what's that? Is he like a little minuscule atom that is seated by a big huge God? Or is there a throne with God on it and Jesus at his right hand and Jesus having been made uh, in, God, in God's image literally and spiritually now at his right hand, somehow there's a relationship there. So much so that God would say, that Jesus would say, when you pray to God, call him your father. He's in the position of your father. So whether it's an anthropomorphic view of God, the Greeks said um, that, or it's been said of the Greeks that they made gods out of men and men out of gods. And the word for that is anthropomorphic. You think of God as like a, a statue-like being that looks like a man. Um, nevertheless, the Bible begins its message with this idea of making man in God's image. And then there's David. What about David? David was a man after God's own heart, which means his mind was like God's mind. Now you know that? Well, you can read the Psalms and find out what God's mind is like. If that's true, then when you read the Psalms that were written by David, you're reading the, the, the kind of thought processes that God has. And you remember a couple of Sundays ago, I gave a talk, and the title of that talk is, Does God Still Think? And although it sounded facetious, um, the point was, of course he thinks. And when he thinks, he thinks with his son. 
And he, he's thinking through the activities of men right now with his angels in the same way that he thought through activities with his angels back in the times of Moses and the kings. God's still thinking. And that thinking is going to produce a command one day in which he sends forth his angels to resurrect the dead, bring the, um, the dead and the living to judgment, and create a host for his son. So when that happens, Jesus is going to sit on the throne of his father David. So David fits into this. Then there's the sons of Zion. Um, who would you say the sons of Zion are? I'm only asking you that because there's two ways you can look at that. There's really no wrong answer for Chris Elfie on this question. Are you asking how loud or are you yeah. asking me? Yeah. 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 I would say spiritual Israel. Spiritual Israel, okay. But spiritual Israel is grafted into natural Israel, so the sons of Zion have a twofold role in that because there's two witnesses. The witnesses that come from Jews, uh, whether they are making a testimony to Christ or not, there's still a witness when God gathered and made, created World War II and the Holocaust and brought them all back to Israel and that gathering was a testimony to God's word, whether they liked it or not. They were witnesses, were they not? So there's other witnesses and those people who have understood the Bible and have conveyed the things of faith to a Gentile world since the times of Christ. And so we have two witnesses and they're spoken about as such in, in the, the Old Testament prophets and in Revelation. So sons of Zion include uh, spiritual Israel and they also include natural Israel. The tendency for Christianity is to completely discount the relationship of natural Israel. There are some who don't. We just saw <coughs> how excited Christians were at the, the uh, dedication of the, the new um, uh, embassy that was moved to Jerusalem. Uh, this was an exciting thing for Christianity. They don't seem to know that, that that's not really going to do any help preserve natural Israel in any sense. But nevertheless, they were very excited. So sons of Zion is a, is a big term, but there's a contrast with that. Then there's the clouds of heaven. And when you read uh, about clouds, we've already spoken about this last week. We're going to go into it again next week. Clouds of heaven is a, is a big illustration of um, people and uh, the, the, the coalescing of people who've risen from the waters of, of humanity to become a heavenly body, which is visible in the world. And that's what a cloud is, why a cloud is such a good metaphor for that. It also contains light and, be, and, and a bright cloud will actually glow with light. Um, so I'm not going to get spend too much time on that because we're about ready to head into it in depth. Then there's a Lion of Judah and we know of course that the Lion of Judah was promised to Judah when um, the sons of, of Jacob were blessed by Jacob and it speaks about Judah being a lion. Uh, spoken about elsewhere, we know that Christ ultimately will take a role as the Lion of Judah. But it's not the only lion spoken about in the Bible. There are other lions there. So we'll talk and look at that. Also, there are mighty ones of Israel. And what's interesting in that term is, uh, what is it that makes the mighty ones of Israel, or the mighty ones who follow Israel through their faith in Christ, what makes them mighty? Because if you think about it, men are also described sometimes in the Bible as being mighty. There are mighty men, and there are the mighty ones of Israel. All this, by the way, relates to Nebuchadnezzar's image, the crisis, and Michael standing up, all of it. So we're really talking about our subject already, even though it's not obvious yet. But if you think about mighty ones as sons of God, and mighty men as sons of men, that's another comparison you remember in Genesis 10 and 11, there's a description of Nimrod and his efforts to build a tower and put himself at the top so that he could establish the kingdom of men. And it, it, Nimrod is identified as the, uh, the first mighty man in the world. So he must have been hugely muscular. He must have kind of looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger or one of those types. Uh, he must have been head and shoulders above all the other men of his time, because that's the way they, men came to be kings. Um, but the Bible also speaks about mighty ones. So if it's muscles and physical prowess and cunning and charisma that makes a mighty man of the world, 
what would you say makes the mighty ones of Israel mighty? John. Trust in God. It's trust. Anything else? That's right. And their trust, their trust is so strong based on the anchors that we're talking about here um, that they become mighty because their characters have that quality of a man who um, ultimately has, is described by Solomon as a man who can rule his spirit, is mightier than he that conquers cities. So you picture, that makes Jesus mightier than Alexander, his antitype. Alexander went and conquered the, the world of his time. He was mighty in battle. But Jesus was a, a, a humble person who had a lamb-like disposition, but he controlled himself. And his, his power to control himself was greater than Alexander's power to rule and over, over uh, nations, other nations, and conquer armies. And anybody who's ever tried to rule his spirit <laughs> understands how much might it takes to even start that. Don't you? Really, you're depressed. Pull yourself out of your depression. Not so easy. You fly off the handle and get really angry. You're having a tantrum. Nobody sees except God. How hard is it to pull yourself around and gain control? But ultimately, the people that, that follow Christ are much stronger in these particular uh, strengths, character strengths, than anybody else in the world. It may look like there are people out there that have mighty self levels of self-control. But the trust leads to the development of self-control, and that is asserted in obedience. And to obey Christ in everything that is unnatural to us requires might. And they are described in the Psalms as being mighty ones. And then there's a Gentile bride. Uh, this bride was identified as such, as the bride of Christ, in some passages in the Old Testament prophecies, but more so as Israel's. Uh, uh, role as a bride of God and that marriage between God and the land and God and the nation of Israel. But in, when Christ comes along, all of God's promises extend to Israel and uh, that extension creates a bride in the Gentile world known as the bride of Christ and identified as such. But she, she, she didn't behave properly in her early years. She was very beautiful and then she suffered horrible persecution, but to get herself out of her impoverished persecution by the Roman Empire, uh, she committed adultery, just like Israel did with the nations around her. And she left Christ and married Caesar. And so she's identified also as a harlot. And if you understand the, the idea of the bride of Christ leaving God to marry the world, you can easily understand why she would be referred to as a harlot in Jesus' final message, warning this, the, the bride that existed at the time that this would happen, so not to be involved in her harlotry. And then there's the kingdom of God, which by virtue of the, the, the story of Nebuchadnezzar and the image and his vision of himself as the great king of the world in the kingdom of men, gets displaced by the kingdom of God. So that's the image of God in all these different themes as they, as they roll out from Genesis to Revelation. So we know these things. <clears throat> Let's look at their antitypes. The seed of the woman begins in, um, in Genesis 3.15 where God tells in, in his um, reproof of Adam and Eve for their sin, he, he explains to them that the, the, there would be a seed of a woman and uh, the seed of the serpent. And the seed of the woman would um, be bruised. The, her, the, the, her seed would have his heel bruised by the serpent, the seed of the serpent, but that he would bruise the head of the seed of the serpent. And we know that's a reference to, it's, it's a very sort of brief reference to the battle that Christ would fight against sin and win. Uh, but it's a theme that comes up everywhere in scriptures, if you think about it. Um, it's not just, just Genesis 3.15 and then, and then Christ. It comes up again in Genesis 12 when God says in thee to Abraham, in thee and in thy seed, 
shall all the families of the earth. And we know that Paul tells us in Galatians 3 that that seed is Christ. So Christ comes up as specifically being the seed of the woman through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David in the lineage of uh, the tribe of, of uh, Judah in Israel. And so he is properly as, as uh, that seed, the lion of the tribe of Judah. So we've, we, we all understand Genesis 3.15 as being the earliest reference to seed, but it, I shouldn't say earliest because it's not actually. When God said, let us make man in our image, he was referring to this lineage of seeds that would go forth, winding up kind of as those in the image of God and those in the image of man, those that would be wheat and bear fruit for righteousness in the world and those that would look like wheat but be tares. Those are also two seeds that when they're planted grow things that look like the same thing, but there's a big difference between them. One is dead and the other is living in terms of its fruit. Um, so that theme is everywhere present in the Bible and a wonderful thing to understand. If I were to ask you how this theology gets you through the day, would you be able to ever say that it does? All right, how about if I put it this way? If it gets you through the day, is it direct or indirect? I'm saying directly related to hope. Directly related to hope. The kingdoms of this world become his. Yeah. And everything else in this world matters little. When you have a hope, which is what Christ had, that hope yeah. set so that's right, it, it generalizes into and reinforces a hope which in us is a huge part of our mental makeup, that hope. So it's a part of one of the sort of genetic ingredients of that hope. Specific, it can be abstract, because see the woman, see the serpent, seems like, okay, that's a theology. Um, I don't think any of us would say that when we have a problem, we go, yeah, but I'm, I, I wanna be the seed of the woman, I'm part of that seed. Uh, but there's an indirect way also in which this affects us when we're bearing a burden. And that is, earlier than God saying, let us make man in our image, he said, let everything produce a seed in itself that brings forth like kind. So, if we are a part of that promise, then something about us is a planting in soil that comes from like kind of God's own son. We're like kind with him. Our minds are disposed, are a reflection of his mind. And that would mean that Jesus is like kind of his father. Something in Jesus came from his father, namely his character. I could get mystical about this idea, not like Trinitarians do. It was his character which came specifically from God's word, planted in his mind and grew into the likeness of his father. So if that same thing happens to us in our stressful day, that likeness of Christ exists in a mental makeup that has the capacity to throw off, it, may, it, it could last for months, this dark period, but it has the capacity to throw it off, recenter us, and get us straight into a more hopeful state, like Jason was referring to, than into the dark state we enter into when we lose that, that priority. So this seed, actually, that's just an illustration. I think we could talk about every one of these things in that light. How does it get you through the day? Um, the next one is the image of God and the image of man. And to do this, I'd like to look at these verses. So that if we look at, at Colossians 1.15, Christ is described as being in the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Christianity has misunderstood that to mean that he predated Adam. But it doesn't. He was the firstborn in that he was firstborn from the dead and it says that in the same context. And by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and inv invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, that is, in status, and in him all things hold together. He's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That's where we understand this to not mean that Jesus had any pre-existence as being firstborn of creation. Um, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. So when you read that, 
you get a full description of what is meant in Genesis when it says, let us make man in our image. That man is Christ. He's spoken of as a seed, and so are we in Psalm 1 as well. Look at Psalm 1. Because Christ and the seed of a woman and the seed of the serpent are mentioned there in Psalm 1. Let's look at this together. I love this psalm. It's just such a perfect way to introduce all the other psalms that follow. When it says, blessed is the man, that's Christ. That's Christ, the man who was made in the image of his father. That's Christ who is this, the immediately um, prioritized um, seed of the woman. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. If he did, he would have followed the Pharisees right down the road. Nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. That was Jesus. He said, I didn't come to destroy it. it if, if you read Psalm 119, you know the heart of Christ. His delight was in God's law. We're still looking at that in Brothers class. We've been looking at it for almost <coughs> half a year now. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and on that law does he meditate day and night. So if you're like Christ, if you're in his image, if you're a seed of the woman, you would be meditating on the laws of God. The law of Moses is the law of God. You'll meditate on that. And although we, it was abolished as law over us, and we don't keep it as law, you'll be thinking about the uh, intrinsic meaning of every law in there and how it translates to a principle that you can apply in your life. In that law, does he meditate day and night? Oh, I don't do that, do you? Day and night? All day, every day? And all, you know, when you go to sleep, are you thinking about the law? I don't think so. You think about any laws? I don't think so. You're thinking about your problems. And once again, that shows you that this idea of a seed has to translate more like what Jason was saying, generally in our life as hope, and that hope anchors us in a lot of different kinds of specifics. So we meditate on that law day and night in the sense that our minds have been saturated with it. And that happens by the readings, it happens by going to Bible schools, it happens by reading uh, Christadelphian books, uh, that is books written by people with the same contemporary spirit about Christ that you have. Uh, it happens when we come to meeting on Sunday and break bread together. That saturation of God's law and all of it works out like that. Is, ever, is an ever-present influence in our mind something that we can return to. He's like a tree, and here's where the seed comes in. The seed of the woman becomes like a tree. It grows into a tree. Isaiah puts it as, an, as oaks of righteousness. This is Christ first and you in his image. Planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. There will be fruit in your life if that seed was planted in your good soil. And its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so. This is the seed of the serpent. The wicked are not so. Their seed just grows into a little shell that encases the, the wheat berry and is blown away in the wind when the wheat is separated from its chaff. The wicked are like chaff, which the wind drives away. They blow away and they are as nothing. That's the seed of the serpent. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. And when it means stand in the judgment, it is not saying they will not come before Christ. There will be plenty of wicked people who stand literally, physically, in the judgment of Christ. And we know this because Jesus said to Caiaphas, you will see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out. So we know this doesn't mean literally standing. What it means is, stand in the favor of Christ so that their standing in uh, the judgment results in standing in everlasting life. It's a, it's a status, not a physical standing. And so he, said, he, he finishes this and we'll finish here today. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, that's the seed of the woman, but the way of the wicked will perish, that's the seed of the serpent. So once again, these theologies may sound in the, like they're abstractions, things that you learn and then you know, 
But that knowledge is, is, is building a knowledge of God inside your mind and your heart that takes over your whole being. And it is the very thing that holds on to you when all is lost in the day or the year or the season that you're in. That season is temporary. The permanent, everlasting season in your heart is this hope. And it is not abstract. It is not irrelevant. It is not a theology. It is the fiber of your embryonic development into sons and daughters of God. So we'll continue with it.